are a blunt force weapon and were used in close-range fighting. Often a Maori warrior would attack an opposing tribesman by swinging the mere club down on his shoulder. This would hopefully break the collarbone or dislocate or break the shoulder. Ooh, then their opponent... What's good, y'all? It's the Duma Shots React, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today, we're back with another American reaction. Super excited about this video. Yes, yes. If you're new to us and, and we new to you, you, make sure you scroll down, hit that subscribe button, button and turn on the post notification bell because we're, we're on the road to 200k. And we cannot get there without you guys, all right? Join the family. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Number 10, their tattoos were carved in. Tattoos held a special significance to the Maori people, and both men and women would get them. The most common place to get them was the face, but some Maori people were Ooh. known to get their necks, torsos, and arms tattooed as well. Oh, most too. Maoris started getting their tattoos during adolescence. Each design was unique, but generally... Now, they, they did say the Maoris at this age, they do tattoos the way tattoos are done, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But back in the day, them boys really had to like, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Bang, yeah. bang, bang their faces and like just to get the Imagine. Ink. Just the whole face numb. I remember a man was speaking, he said they did have it harder. Yeah. He said they did have it harder. We're in the shape of spirals. They were tattooed on during a ceremony and each line showed the person's bravery and strength. Wow. After all, these tattoos weren't put on using a needle gun. Instead, they were carved into the skin using a mallet and a chisel that was made from bone and the ink was made from ash and fat. This left the skin with grooves like a record instead of being smooth like modern tattoos. Number 9. The War Dance one of the most notable traditions used by Maori warriors and still used by many of their national sports teams today is the traditional native dance called the haka. During the dance, the participants say a chant, stamp their feet, stick out their tongues, and bulge out their eyes. While the dance was often performed to welcome special guests, it was actually developed for war. The dance was used in two different ways. The first is that it was used to intimidate their opponents. Mm -hmm. The other way it was used was that it was performed before a battle during a ritual. If there was something wrong with the dance, then the elders were sure that it was a bad omen. This gave them the chance to either abandon or modify their plans. Number 8. The Mere Club was used to crack skulls. Mm. The Mere Club was the most common weapon used by Maori warriors. It was in the shape of a teardrop and made from bone, jade, or stone. They were often cry, decorated right? and considered heirlooms since it took so long to craft one. They are a blunt force weapon and were used in close range fighting. Often a Maori warrior would attack an opposing tribesman by swinging the Mere Club down on his shoulder. This would hopefully break the collarbone or dislocate or break the shoulder. Ooh, then their opponents would be unable mm. to defend himself against a blow to the head, often to the temple. Low. Behind the temple is the terian, which is the weakest point of the skull. Since oh, the skull the is so thin there, it usually only took one blow to that area to kill an opposing warrior. <laughs> Number 7. The dead were buried and dug back up again and then reburied. The Maori had Why? a very unusual method for burying their dead. Starting early in their culture, the Maori people began to bury people twice. First, after a week or two of mourning, the body was wrapped in mats and then would be buried and allowed to decompose. Then mm. a year later, the bodies were dug up and the bones were scraped to remove any remaining flesh. The bones were then painted with red ochre, which is a natural pigment, and mm. taken to different settlements where they once again mourned the dead. Then there was another ceremony before they were buried again in a sacred place. Once the second burial was complete, the person's soul would go on to their mysterious afterlife. Number 6. Wow. The War Strategy A war party called a hapu usually never consisted of more than 100 men, and in some cases women fought as well. Sometimes multiple hapus would come together, but with more warriors, they became less organized. Warriors were also trained from a young age, and every male was trained as a warrior. One specific thing they worked on was wrist strength. This would make their weapons, like the mir, much more effective. How the Maoris would attack other tribes is by traveling to enemy settlements quietly or pretending they were out on a hunting expedition. Once they got close, they would attack often at dawn. All the men were killed because this eliminated the chance that any tribesmen could come back and seek revenge. The women were also taken as a prize of war. Number 5. Heads of the killed were taken as trophies. Oh, heads held man. a special That's... significance for oh, Maori man. people, and they were known to take the heads of their fallen enemies. Once they had the head, they would remove the brain and the eyes. Next, all the orifices were sealed with flax fiber and gum. The head was then boiled or steamed in an oven. Then, the heads were dried in the sun for several days, and they were treated with shark oil. 
One reason why they kept the heads of their enemies was that so they could mock it later. One missionary said he watched one chief say to the head of an enemy chieftain, You wanted to run away, didn't you? But my greenstone club overtook you, and after you were cooked, you were made food for me. And where is your father? He is cooked. And where is your brother? He is eaten. And where is your wife? There she sits, a wife for me. And Whoa. where are your children? There they are, loads on their backs, carrying food as my slaves. Yo, look, they, hey, they ain't lying when they say they really take them women for like prizes. Like, yeah. <laughs> everybody else is, y'all done. Baby, and they show Ooh. no remorse. No remorse. None. And they ain't eating them. That's true. That's what he just said. He said they boiled them. He said, Where's your father? I ate him. Let me play it back. I heard it. <laughs> no, <laughs> y'all didn't hear him. Y'all think y'all heard him correctly. He said he devoured. Them. He's ate them up from the top. Let me hear. Head of an enemy chief, Dane. You wanted to run away, didn't you? Mm. And my greenstone club overtook you. And after you were cooked, you were made food for me. Oh. And where is your father? He is cooked. And where is your brother? He is eaten. And where is your wife? There she sits. There. A wife for me. And where are your children? Oh, there they are, loads on their backs, carrying food as my slaves. The wife is just traumatized at this traumatized. point. Traumatized. She, she, she is traumatized at this point. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, I can't. Okay. Okay. If that wasn't insulting enough, they also developed a bizarre game with the heads. They would oh. pile them in a heap and then set the head of the principal chief on the top of the pile. Then, using stones or other heads, they took turns trying to knock off the head at the top of the pile. Number four, Captain James Cook's first encounter was terrifying. The first encounter between the Europeans and the Maori was in December of 1646, when a Dutch ship made landfall near a Maori tribe. Both groups were standoffish, and this led to a small fight that resulted in deaths on both sides. After the run-in, the Dutch sailed off, and Europeans would not go back until October 1767, when okay. English navigator James Cook traveled there looking for the fabled Fourth Continent. When Captain Cook first encountered the Maori, they sent out two war canoes to meet them. When the canoes approached, two full-grown Maori warriors, complete with face tattoos, stood up and held the shrunken heads of their latest opponents, who were also covered with tattoos. Cook and his crew immediately noticed the detail on the faces and knew the heads were real. Cook mm. wanted to interact with the Maori peacefully, but there were some misunderstandings and the what? Maori acted aggressively. As a result, the Europeans were supposedly forced to kill a few Maori in self-defense, much to the dismay of Cook. To convince them that they had come in peace, Cook and his men ended up kidnapping some Maori warriors. They acted kindly to them and then let them go. This led to a better relationship between the Maori and the Europeans, which would play an important role in, in the shaping of New Zealand. Number three, their most famous warrior, Hongi Hika. Hongi it is believed Hika. that the most famous Maori chief, Hongi Hika, was born in 1778. As a young man, he was a fierce and agile warrior who rose up through the ranks of his tribe. His chief got along with the Europeans and also saw the value of muskets in warfare. The chief managed to trade with the Europeans for several guns and ammo in 1808. The tribe then got into a war with another tribe. Hika's tribe fired off their first shots with their muskets, but the problem with the muskets is that they take at least 20 seconds to reload. Right. The other tribe used this time to attack. Many members of Hika's tribe, including the chief, were slaughtered. Hongi Hika was one of the lucky few to get away. With the chief dead, Hongi Hika was the most senior, so he took control of the tribe. The defeat, however, could have well discouraged Hongi Hika from using muskets. However, he had the foresight to see that muskets could be an incredibly important part of warfare. So he got closer to the Europeans, even visiting Australia and England, where he became a bit of a sensation because of his tattoos. He even converted to Christianity and set up the first Christian mission in New Zealand. This relationship to the church gave Hongi Hika access to more rifles because he vowed to become a defender of the church. However, he wasn't simply given all the guns, instead trading for them. As for what the Europeans wanted in exchange for the guns, well, that was shrunken heads. In fact, as the trade became more common, slaves and prisoners of war were brought to the Europeans and they chose which heads they wanted. The Maori mm. then tattooed the chosen victim and decapitated them. The market got so flooded with Maori heads that they were being sold for as little as two pounds, which was about a week's wage in England for a working man. Nevertheless, Hongihiko was able to amass wow. over 3,000 guns and plenty of ammo and gunpowder in his 10 years as chief. Starting in 1818, his tribe slaughtered other tribes and took their women. Within a year, he had complete control over northern New Zealand. However, other tribes soon followed in Hongihika's footsteps and bought their own guns. Hongihika was killed when he took a bullet in the lung in 1828. Number 2. Infanticide 
Like other warrior cultures, the Maoris committed infanticide. Females were more likely to be killed because tribes needed more males, since every male was a warrior and there needed to be a decent number of warriors to ensure the security of the tribe. Also, males were more likely to be killed in battle, meaning that there would have been an upset in the sex ratios later in life. Infanticide was also common if there was anything wrong with the baby. Essentially, there were five ways that the infants were killed. Their skulls could be crushed, they could be drowned in a stone basin, strangulation, suffocation, or finally, the most disturbing way was that the mothers would press against the soft spot on the skull and kill the baby instantly. Well, isn't that cheery? Hey, we can't say we didn't warn you. Terrifying is right there in the title. Number 1. They Performed Cannibalism Whether the Maori warriors committed cannibalism or not is highly debated. Some historians believe that it was just Europeans trying to paint the Maoris as wild savages. However, besides witness accounts of cannibalism, tribal oral histories, and archaeological evidence also strongly suggest that the Maori warriors indulged in cannibalizing vanquished enemies. There are a few reasons that the Maori ate their opponents, and it wasn't because they were hungry. One was to internalize their spirit, which they called mana. Another theory is that cannibalism was part of their post-battle rage. Another is that it would send a message to enemies. They thought that the greatest humiliation you could do your enemy was to kill them, chop them up, eat them, and then excrete them out. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up. All right, now man. Now you gotta worry about us becoming y'all enemies. We're going to war. We like the Maori. We need y'all to keep the bodies, y'all. Yeah, keep your kill. Keep your kill. Ooh. Bring it back with you. Y'all didn't come to play. Them boys are different, man. Y'all didn't come to play at all. Oh, Lord. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Mm. Y'all wasn't playing. Mm. Mm -mm. Y'all wasn't playing. That's what they do. Uh -huh. That's how to get down. All right. Let's continue talking about modern day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we hope you guys enjoyed this video with us. Like this video, subscribe, turn on the post notification bell. We have enabled our super, super thanks if you like to support the channel that way, as well as our reaction request form is in our description, description box, box below. below. We'll see you soon. Peace.